more change in the world of sales, professional selling, in the last eight months than there has been in the last 20 years. And we haven't seen anything yet. Processes, technologies, capabilities, taking advantage of other technologies. It's amazing what's happening in sales. I don't have time to bring you up to date on all of it, but let me show you a couple of things that are happening in sales and see if this stimulates an idea in your mind. See if this is something you might want to teach somebody else. Is sales an art or a science? And here's where we get confused. Are any two salespeople the same? What's the answer? No. If you try to sell like me, you will fail miserably. And if I try to sell like you, I will fail miserably. But using the same principles, we can both be successful in sales. Everybody has a different mindset, different experience level, different capabilities. So if no two salespeople are the same, what about customers? Are any two customers the same? What's the answer? No, and customers are different on subsequent contacts. Is that correct? So how could sales possibly be a science? I liken it to surgery. If you had to go under the knife, would you choose a surgeon who is highly trained, very analytical, or a surgeon who is very creative? Which would you choose? Now, the creative one might leave you with a scar that would amuse some of your friends, but we would like to have the analytics. Is that correct? Now, imagine you're in the operating room. You're laying on the... We have some medical folks here today. You're laying on the table. Would you like for the first thing that you hear to be a highly qualified surgeon saying, scalpel? Or would you like for the first thing that you hear to be an anesthesiologist saying, would you count backwards from 100? Which would you choose? I think I'd like to sleep through this particular procedure. A study came out of the UK where they reinstituted the checklist in the OR theater, that's pre-op, op, and post-op. When they reinstituted the checklist, post-op complications went down. How important is the checklist, do you think? Post-op mortality went down. How important is the checklist? The pre-call planning is the salesperson's checklist. This is what we need to be going through. We're not going to lose a sale on some big mistake. It's some little thing that we forgot to do, something that we just didn't go through the checklist. Think back to your initial calls. How do we go about doing that? I liken it to... Uh, Captains in airplanes. I've flown a bunch this week, and this afternoon I will fly back to Atlanta. When we're getting on the airplane, what is the captain doing? Going through the checklist, right? Why? How many times has he or she flown this airplane? How many times has he or she flown this particular route? Don't you like it that they're going through the checklist? How much stuff do they have to miss to create a catastrophe? So for us sales professionals, we profess to be a professional. The checklist becomes important. If sales is a science, number one, it must be measurable. And here's what we are finding. Every aspect of sales can now be measured. Some of the analytics that are coming out now are just absolutely phenomenal. The best ideas that I get come from multinational companies where I'm positioned with the highest ranking person in North America. So I know they speak good English, we can communicate well, but typically their home office is in some other country. The best example I've seen of this is a company in the Atlanta area, fortunately. They're based in Germany. I was teaching their salespeople value-added selling because they thought they sold a commodity. There are no commodities. I'm teaching, that's a function of sales. I was over at the plant one day and the CEO called me into his office. He said, how long do you teach value-added selling? I said, well, I've been teaching value-added selling for a couple of decades. But there's value. I thought, is that a good question or what? You know, we toss these words out as if everybody knows what it meant. What is value? He and I sat down, and here's what we figured out. First of all, there are four components to value. If you profess to have value, you must have these four components. Quality, service, timeliness, and cost. Quality, service, timeliness, and cost. Quality means if the quality is not there, how could there possibly be value? If it's not going to last, if it's not going to endure, if it's not going to work well. Quality, service. I would like to know that there's a level of service behind whatever it is that I'm buying. Nothing works perfectly every time. Sometimes it's operator error. I still want to know there's a level of service. Quality, service, timeliness. Is it there when I need it? It doesn't matter how good the quality is, how good the price is. If, the, if it's not there when I need it, it's useless. Quality, service, timeliness, and please write down the word cost. And beside it, write down the word price and then draw a line through it. We don't talk about price, we talk about cost. 
the item with the lowest price tag has the highest cost. And so we developed a value calculator. We came up with an algorithm that would actually compute those. You can go to salesuites.com, click on tools, and there it is. So the next time your customer says your price is too high, could we talk about value for just a moment? Use this calculator to rate my value quotient. They actually move sliders on their screen and it gives a value quotient. And now would you rate my competitor in their value quotient and somewhere in that dialogue they will show you why they're thinking about leaving. They will show you where you could be a little bit better. And while you're at it, ask them to rate one more vendor, Cheap and Dirty Ink, the Slipshod Brothers, the worst in the industry but the lowest price. And what they'll see is, yeah, they got the lowest price, but they also have the lowest value. Every aspect of sales can be measured. What could you put into place to start measuring more and more of your sales activity? If it's measurable, it is predictable. We can now predict what's going to happen in sales. There are two types of predictability, and those of you that work in service bays, this is an opportunity for you to really shine. The two types of predictability are analytic and behavioral. Analytic and behavioral. Behavioral analytics, work, uh, behavioral predictability works like this. You don't want to buy anything, do you? Somehow my sales are going, you still don't want to buy anything, do you? My sales are going down and I don't know why. Why aren't you buying from us? Nobody else is. We start doing things with our behavior that drive down our performance. Maybe we want to look at that. Analytical predictability. We can now predict when people are going to buy. How many of you think the internet is here to stay? And how many of you think it's evil and a whole bunch of trouble? How many of you think computers are a communist plot designed to drive down productivity? That's my mindset. I look at these technology things and I don't want to get involved in this, but it is a valuable tool, especially for us salespeople. We can now predict what's going to happen. What will happen next? And I've seen some incredible examples of this. Replicatable. Now here's what we're looking at. How can we replicate more and more of our sales activities? The first and easiest example of this would be cut and paste. Remember when we learned cut and paste? Boy, this is great. I don't have to type this again. I can copy it and paste it. Well, now that's gone off into an exponential level. How can we replicate more and more of our sales processes, our sales abilities? The best example I've seen of this. There's a company in South Carolina. I had trained their sales force. The chief called and asked me to come back and do some more training. This is like getting a second date with the same girl. I must have done something right the first time. And so we talked about it and I was excited until he told me the date. It's right in the middle of vacation week and family before business. Besides, I don't get to see my daughter and son-in-law and most importantly, the granddaughter. Frequently enough and they're coming down for vacation so that's gonna, how many of you have grandkids? Greatest invention in the history of man. The rest of you will experience this at some point. Despite what Thomas Edison and Steve Jobs did, this is the best invention in the history of man. They're coming down. We got a place over at Hilton Head we're going to stay. So I said, thank you very much. Let me find a speaker for you. Well, he became insistent. He called early one morning. He said, where are you going to be on vacation? I thought, uh-oh, they have an airplane. I think I know where this is going. I said, well, actually, we're going to be at Hilton Head. He said, our meeting is at Amelia Island. That's two hours down the road. I said, okay, I will check with the family and see what the family says, but they called the shot. So I called my daughter. I put her through college majoring in international business. She is a beautiful, intelligent, compassionate young woman. And I called her up and explained the situation. She said, go ahead and do the piece of business. It's a good client. Go ahead and do the piece of business. Earn a lot of money bring it back and spend it on me. So apparently the education is paying off. It actually worked apparently. So I went down Tuesday night, I always go in the night before, don't like things at the last minute, but also they were going to showcase what they wanted me to convince the salespeople to use. This is what we call a mature sales force. Is that being kind? Everybody's got at least as much gray hair as I do. They don't send emails, and when they do, it's all caps. Got the picture? We are not talking about technological genii here. They were going to leave with an iPad with a killer app on it. I'm not using killer superficially. Killer app because we estimate by the end of this year, it will kill every company in that industry except for three. This is how powerful the app is. What this app does, replicatable, 
it reduces a portion of their sales cycle from three weeks to three minutes. Three weeks to three minutes. 40% of their business is in disaster recovery. So your plant has had a disaster. You've lost 20% of your production capacity. Two vendors come in and offer to get you back up and running. One can have you up and running three weeks earlier than the other one. Which one are you going to go with? That one. What about the price? Say it louder, please. Say it one more time. It doesn't matter. That's how important price is. We think a wholesale hinges on price. If we don't have the lowest price, there's no way we're going to be able to sell. It simply doesn't matter. Thank you for that, by the way. So the next morning, I stand up in front of these guys. i got to convince them to use this iPad thing. And I said, enjoyed meeting you folks last night. Fabulous company here. A lot of good people. Some of you know that I'm on vacation this week. And the best part of vacation, I have to admit, is the granddaughter. I'll be sitting in the living rooms in the, in the living room in the mornings, and she'll come in and she'll climb up in my lap while her slug of a mother and father, she'll climb up in my lap and she'll grab my wife's iPad and open it up. She'll hit the power button and then she'll swipe and she'll look for the Sarah Claire icon. She has her own icon. She'll touch that and all the families of games that we've downloaded for her will show up on the screen and she'll look them over. She'll pick a family and touch that and all the games inside that family open up and she'll pick one and that's the game that we play. Did I mention she's 13 months old, can't walk and can't talk, but she can drive the bejabbers out of an iPad? And while you're here honing your skills, sharpening your axe, your competitors have been at the donut shop getting a bag of donuts because they need to make a sales call. Their day is over and they don't even realize it. The world of sales is moving forward. It's moving forward faster than it ever has before. Sales is a science, therefore it is measurable, it is predictable, it is replicatable. Here comes the fun part, it is automatable. More and more of sales is going to be automated. There's a new science now called RSA, Real Sales Automation. It takes the CRM to an absolute new level. It takes all that stuff that we've been doing in sales where we've had tools and technologies and capabilities, it takes all of that to the next level. And you are going to have to decide which of these technologies and capabilities are right for our organization. And once your organization decides that, you're going to have to decide which one of these are right for me. The best example I've seen of this is a company in Park City, Utah. The CEO built and sold a software company in Atlanta. I did not know him when he was in Atlanta, but he built and sold this company. He's still in his 30s. His kids are adolescents. He is set for life. He took his kids on an around-the-world journey. He wanted them to see all of the options that are available in the world. Isn't that great? Don't you wish we could have done that? As part of that journey, he went through Park City, Utah and realized he was home. So he got a ranch and some horses, never came back to Atlanta, and started this new software company that will make a school board paperless. School boards go through a lot of paper. And he has a heart for sustainability. He has a heart for education. So he's got this software now that will make a school board paperless. So he went to the school districts. And he said, I've got this software. It will eliminate your need for paper. And the school board said, that's great. We would like to have it, but we don't have any money. So he called me in. We went to work. We built a calculator. We built a tool that they could actually sit down and show the school district. We finished it two weeks prior to their annual convention. The convention that year was at McCormick Place. They had the King booth in the trade show. So when you walk into the trade show floor, there they are. You can't miss them. In two weeks, they reworked their booth. So there's nothing on the front of the booth now but a 60-inch flat panel. And school board members would come up to the booth, and they would ask the question, Have, has your district considered going paperless? And what did the board members say? Yes, but we don't have any money. Tell me your first name, by the way. Todd. Todd. So Todd's a school board member from whatever, Memphis. So he's just told me he didn't have any money. Todd, would you take this wireless mouse and move these sliders for me? There were sliders on the calculator. Would you take this wireless mouse and move this slider for me? Did you observe the tectonic change that just happened between the vendor and the prospect? For years, we have said 80% of selling happens at the subconscious subliminal level. That number is now 93% of our communication is happening at the subconscious subliminal level. The third highest authority in America, which all of you know is Dr. Phil, put the 93 percentile in his latest book. So much of our communication is happening at a different level. As salespeople, either we take control of it or the customer does. Pick one. 
Would you for me? Would you for me? If you're not writing down those four words, I highly recommend you do that. Would you for me? Managers, look your employees in the eye when they don't want to do something, phrase it somehow around, would you for me? You heard Don say in the introduction, I was a technician at AT AT&T for 10 years. Every morning for 10 years, I got up, put on my blue jeans, packed my lunch in a brown paper sack, went down to 51 Ivy Street, downtown Atlanta, and soldered wires. I installed equipment, I adjusted equipment, and I uninstalled equipment. That was going to be my job, technician until I retire. All I ever thought I was capable of doing was that. One day, my boss's boss called me into his office and said, I see more in you than you see in yourself. I'm going to get you out of here. Salespeople, your customers will buy into that. Companies don't do business with companies. People do business with people. Managers, your people will step up to the next level. I thought he was going to send me to engineering. He sent me to sales. I didn't want to go to sales. I can't speak in public. I can't meet strangers and talk to these people. Self-esteem is way too low. This is what sales does to a person. Uh, Sales changed the way that I approached pretty much everything in life. My first full year as an account executive, I was the highest producer out of 1,100 people. What's the lesson here? You need another salesperson? Look in the ranks. You may have a forklift driver. You may have somebody on an obscure desk somewhere in the bowels of the organization. That may be your next great salesperson. Would you for me? Did you know that most buyers are better at buying than salespeople are at selling? They do more of it. Did you know that today many buyers are better at selling than salespeople are at selling? They're doing the selling. How many times have you heard a buyer say the equivalent of would you for me? Okay, if you'll just sharpen your pencil for me, I think we can make this deal. Would you for me? Who's in control of the sales call? So the, Todd, is that right? Todd, good, thank you. So Todd takes the mouse and he starts moving the sliders. Now here's what we've learned about these calculators. If you're going to build them for your organization, the first inputs from the customer have to be so easy the customer cannot possibly get them wrong. How many board meetings do you have per year? Is Todd going to know the answer to that question? Yes, so he moves the slider. And how many board members do you have? He knows the answer, he moves the slider. Then we start asking more difficult questions. If he's like most people, he'll start lowballing the numbers. That's okay. Customer behavior is predictable, it's habitual. When he moves the sixth and final slider, a green button appears. Todd, would you click that button for me? Would you for me? Would you for, and your response is, well, of course I would do that. He clicks the button, a number comes up. And it's typically in the $30,000 range, so we'll say it's $31,200. Todd, according to your inputs, not mine, yours, if your school district, not you, never put the customer on the spot, if your school district had implemented board dogs last year, based on your calculations, after paying for the software, you would have seen a $31,000 savings. The salespeople wanted to stop there. That's called a qualified and quantified cost justification. A qualified and quantified cost justification. You can't stop there. What's the next question I must ask Todd? So Todd, if your school district had an additional $31,000 right now, what would you folks be doing with it? Now suppose he says the elementary school needs new playground equipment. Why are they buying our software? Playground equipment. Now, when you're selling in the service bay and you ask the customer to upgrade, when you ask the customer to take this additional service, they're probably going to say, no, that's just more expenditure. If you paint a picture that says, I don't want to see you on the side of the road, I don't want you to be out with your family and have a mechanical failure because some of these parts are at the end of their life cycle. When they think you care about them, they will care about you. They went around, they were closing sales at the trade show floor, on the trade show floor. They couldn't really close anything because in school districts it has to be closed in an open forum. Can you do the same thing? How do we go about changing that? And by the way, what's the price of the board doc software? You've just seen the entire sales presentation. They're pre-closing sales on the trade show floor. What is the price of the board doc software? Tell me. You don't know because it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. That's how important price is. Why are we putting price up front when price should be somewhere else?